From the beginning of Mark, the reader knows who Jesus is, the Messiah, the Son of God, Mark 1.1. However, people in the story struggle with understanding just who he is and what he is all about, except for those with demons. They know exactly who he is. The demons recognize him and wither before his mighty words. But Jesus rather consistently commands that they keep this information quiet. Why this command for secrecy? Bible students for centuries have mulled over this question. Hello once again and good morning to all those of our Whispering Hope fans, our added fans and those who have been uh, blessing the gospel, blessing this channel by spreading the word, spreading the videos and commenting and, you know, making this a uh, worthwhile venture. And so we say good morning to you. It's uh, Tuesday morning as usual, and we're getting close to the middle of the month. Uh, time is flying by. Mm -hmm. And this Tuesday morning, we have in our studios to help us to understand this lesson for today. We have the very committed and always present Elder Jacqueline Gordon. Elder Gordon, welcome this morning. How are you doing? Good morning. I am wonderful. I'm doing great. And I'm just thanking God for life. Good morning, everyone. Welcome once again. And I know as we all sit at the feet of Jesus, we will be enlightened by and through his word. Excellent. Thank you so much, Elder Gordon. And this morning we have in place of Elder Andy David. Elder Andy David is away on assignment. Let's just put it that way. We have Elder Kyle Phillip. And those of you of Whispering Hope family, you will be familiar with Elder Kyle. He has been on Whispering Hope in various capacities before and continues to do so from time to time. Elder Kyle, happy to have you this morning, and we know that God is going to bless us as we move forward with our study for this morning. So welcome, and just greet the folks this morning. Thanks again, and a pleasant good morning to one and all, and it's always a pleasure to be on with you, and hope it's been a long time coming. But, you know, I am glad to fill in for Brother David, and I pray that as we continue to traverse through the Word of God, that our minds and our hearts will be enlightened, and that will be transformed into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. Excellent. So welcome, Elder Kyle, and I pray that all Whispering Hope family will be uh, welcoming you as well this morning. We're going to start with a word of prayer because, as I always say on this show, on this session, that we dare not open the word of God without first requiring from him or asking him for guidance of his Holy Spirit to help us to understand and to rightly represent him. So I'm going to ask Elder Jacqueline Gordon to give us our prayer for this morning. Let us pray, Almighty God and our Heavenly Father. Lord, we are thankful. Indeed, we are so thankful for the gift of life. Thankful for this opportunity where we are in the land of the living and oh God because you have granted us life. Today we just want to continue to praise, glorify and magnify your name. As we get into your word dear God, we ask that your Holy Spirit will teach us your will. Lord, it's not about us, it's all about you. So teach us and allow all of us as we listen, as we partake, oh God, to be determined to follow you. Come what me, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, Elder Gordon. So we're looking at lesson number seven for this week. And for those who are continuing to follow Whispering Hope on a daily basis, you would I've already looked at Monday and Sunday's lesson. And the lesson for, for this week is entitled Teaching Disciples, Part 1. So, of course, you know, there's a Part 2 coming next week. So, Teaching Disciples, Part 1. And I'm going to ask Elder Kyle, looking at the grand topic for this week, Teaching the Disciples, Part 1, and also looking at the lesson for Tuesday, which we're going to be getting into in a minute. Tuesday's lesson is entitled The Mountain and the Multitude. Elder Kyle, can you give, bring us some synergy or some connectivity in terms of the mounting and the multitude and teaching the disciples part one? What's the relevance of the topic and the subtopics as you would have seen them in this week's study? I would like to start by diving into the memory text of the week. It's a very interesting memory text and it says here, When he called the people to himself with his disciples, he said to them, Whosoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his course and follow me. So right here we have the gospel call. It's interesting that yesterday's lesson speaks about the course of discipleship. But as we're getting into the mountain and multitude now, we, we're looking at the two dynamic phases of Christ's ministry because Christ had and what we'd have in reach, what, what some of us would say as in reach and outreach. We had his time where he'd spend with his disciples and he trained them and he teach them, which is what he did often at the, at the mountaintop, as well as being mixed in with the life of teach them how to pray and to demonstrate before them how a leader or true shepherd leads his 
leads the flock as they will be on the shepherds and the, the church will be committed to their care after his departure but then the multitude now jesus recognized that as a follower of god our lives cannot be lives of isolation we cannot be in either extreme we cannot be found in the mary camp or the martyr camp there has to be a balancing of both and i believe that what the lesson was trying to bring out to us is that as christians we can't hide our lights and we can't spend all of our times helping others as well too but we need to have that balance and that time with god so that by god's grace that he will help us and give us the impetus he'll give us the energy as we refill and we take our daily portion with him have our devotions etc that we'll be empowered and invigorated to face the day and to you know, I'm past you to say it as a vital current and just diffuse life and joy and love and peace to all that are all those that are around us. So, you know, that's where I got it from the the mountain and the multitude to put it in a nutshell. All right. Thank you so much, Elder Kyle, for that. I noticed in the memory text, Elder Gordon, that it says that we should deny ourselves, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Help us here, Elder Gordon. The cross, what's the symbol of the cross? I'm not talking about in today's world, 2024. In Jesus' time, the symbol of the cross, good, bad, positive, negative, why would Christ ask disciples to pick up a cross and to follow him? The cross, from my knowledge, wasn't all that positive back then. Help us out here. Let me refer to Christ and his crucifixion. The human mindset, it denotes negativity, it denotes separation. But I think what Christ is doing here, as he embraces the, his ministry now, and for us to follow him, the whole concept of denying, self-denial, and this is often the difficulty in following Jesus. And if you look at the context when he spoke with his disciples, it was Peter himself. I mean, they all like Jesus. They all were happy to follow him. When he was healing the sick and raising the dead and feeding the multitude, we all want to be associated with somebody like that. I mean, somebody powerful. I mean, we have this powerful man we're walking with and the whole world wants to converge with this man who is able to perform all these miracles. Now that Jesus is turning to the chapter, the real purpose to which he had Come, and that is to give his life a ransom for many. It was Peter himself who said, No, Lord, you're talking foolishness. The Bible said, Peter rebuked Jesus when Jesus spoke about him being dead on the cross and he will rise on the third day. And so that rebuke came from Peter. How could he be walking with Jesus, call himself a disciple of Christ, and yet still not prepared to understand the true ministry, and that is to die to self. So Jesus died on the cross. He's asking us to die to self. Take up our cross. What it is that we agonize us. What it is that is have, having us so perplexed. Just take it up and go with Jesus because ultimately the church militant will one day be the church triumphant according to Sister White. All right. Thank you so much, Elder Gordon. We're going to move now into Tuesday's lesson proper, the mountain and the multitude. We're looking at the mountain and the multitude. And elders, there's a particular passage of scripture which is the basis for our study or discussion this morning. And we're going to get into that passage of scripture. And then we're going to look and try and understand the, the message or the whole scenario that is being played out and try and pull from that what the lesson is trying to teach us this morning. So we're going to go to Mark chapter 9, verses 1 to 13. Mark 9, 1 to 13. And we're going to read that. Both elders are going to read it alternately for us this morning as you follow along on Whispering Hope. And at the end of it, we're going to pose several questions to see how we can best answer or unravel, or as they say today, unpack that passage of Scripture. So Mark chapter 9, verses 1 to 13, I'm going to ask Elder Gordon to begin, and we will read alternately Elder Kyle until verse 13. Okay. Mark chapter 9, verses 1 to 13, really from the King James version and he said unto them verily i say unto you that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of god come with power and after six days jesus taketh with him peter and james and john and leadeth them up into an high mountain apart by themselves and he was transfigured before them and his raiment became shining exceeding white as snow so as no fuller on earth 
can bite them. And there appeared unto him Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said, said to Jesus, Master, is it good for us to be here? Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Yes. For he wits not what to say, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And suddenly when they looked around about, they saw no man any more, save Jesus only with themselves. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the son of man were risen from the dead and they kept that saying with themselves questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean and they asked him saying why say the scribes that elias must first come and he answered and told them elias verily come at first and restore it all things and how it is written of the son of man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. And verse 13, But I say unto you, that Elias is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they, they listed, as it is written of him. Okay, thank you so much, Ellen, for reading that passage of Scripture. A very intriguing, very uh, notable and memorable passage of Scripture to all those who are Bible students and even those who are not. And so it is referred to a term as the, the Mount of Transfiguration where the three disciples came on the mount with Christ as he invited them to do that. And so the title of our study is The Mountain and the Multitude. So let's start, let's take the first part of the title, The Mountain. So they were up on the mountain. Help us here, Elder, Elder Gordon, to understand what did Peter, James, and John see on the mountain with Jesus? Just tell us what they saw and what's the relevance of what they saw. They actually saw Jesus being transfigured. They saw the shining light. They saw, they saw it. The Bible said they, they were actually afraid. Hence the reason why Peter spoke. But Jesus is all about teaching his disciples. So they saw Jesus being transfigured, but Jesus had a powerful lesson for them. All right, so he had a powerful lesson for them. So Elder Kyle, they saw two other persons there with Jesus. And we know that these persons from the Old Testament, both Elijah and Moses, that they were precursors to Jesus Christ coming into flesh. And we also have in this passage of scripture that Jesus is mentioning something about Elijah. Do, they, do the disciples understand what he's saying about Elijah and help us to understand what he said, first of all, and what's the significance of mentioning Elijah in the context in which he is now being transfigured on the mountain with these three disciples? Well, what was happening here basically is that as he was configuring, as he was transfigured for them, he was strengthening their faith, and a conversation was being ensued between Moses and Elijah. Where I believe that even as Jesus was trying to strengthen their faith by what they, they they saw, they came to strengthen the faith of Christ. And you know, as a conversation happened, they didn't know, and you know, Peter being the usual, the rash one and the one that usually is quick with the brains and his mouth, he said, you know, he said, Jesus, but how, how is it that they say that Elijah would first come? Because now he's saying, okay, Jesus, you appeared on the scene, but now you're talking to Elijah, but he did. The, the scribe says that Elijah has to come first, which is making a mention of the prophecy in Malachi chapter 4 where um, the bible speaks of elijah coming and you know this was this was fulfilled through the ministry life and the ministry of john the baptist who heralded the opening of christ's ministry but because they, it was rejected by the leaders at that time and because john did not come in with a flat or to sue them you know it was rejected and what happened to the disciples because these were the men that were teaching in israel they had adopted that false view and that's why you know they went to christ and they thought now just have this view rectified because they're trying to rectify okay this is what the teachers are saying but this is what we are saying and we're, we're basically saying you're here elijah came but elijah did not come and introduce you but what jesus was speaking to is that john the baptist came in the spirit and the power of elijah so it was not literally Elijah, but he came and he did a work out to which that Elijah would did in his day. A work of reformation, a work that led to repentance and a work that led Israel 
back to God. So this is what Jesus was trying to explain to his disciples as they came to him perplexed with these questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Elder Kyle. And finally, on this part of the, on the scripture, Elder Gordon, Elder Kyle just spoke about Elijah or coming in the spirit of Elijah, of course, not the actual Elijah. And what they saw on the Mount of Transfiguration, yes, was the actual Elijah and, and Moses. But that's in a spiritual way in terms of not, not being tangible or coming back to life, being there and they, you know, they could, could engage with them and so on. Christ was being in contact with them through the Father, through the Holy Spirit. And of course, it was on the Mount of Transfiguration where something miraculous happened. But, Elder God, Jesus is saying to the disciples that Elijah has come in the form of John the Baptist. Based on the, 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 the story and the remainder of the story, did the disciples actually get it, though? That, did, did they get that John the Baptist was Elijah that came in the spirit? Because we see even after this, and that's out of the realm of this study for this morning, but we see after this from being good Bible students that the disciples had misconceptions and understandings as to who Christ was and what his purpose was. So why is it that you, Elder God, being in the presence of Jesus, there with him for three and a half years, or in this case, not three and a half years as yet, but you still miss it? Does that say something about us as Christians today? Can, can we or do we miss certain things that Christ is telling us and, and, and how, how can we overcome that? I know it's many questions, but help us out. <laughs> and this is why we have to just pray and constantly abide in the word of God. We have to just seek God daily and follow his word and just allow them, bathe in them and allow them to saturate our entire beings. Because as you ask the question, I don't think the disciples got it. I remember, though this is not a part of our study, Remember right up to when Jesus was in the courtroom, the judgment hall, and Peter denied him after having the communion service. So it was just Judas betrayed him. And so it was a lack of understanding. Even when Jesus was resurrected on the third day and Christ spoke to Mary Magdalene, she went back to the disciples who were dead, terrified and afraid. So I think they did not understand. And so we have to say, help me, heaven help us all as we are here representing the church and oftentimes we fail to have that level of faith and fail to understand Jesus for who he is. And Jesus, if you notice, Jesus here was just doing everything to teach and to console his disciples. He knew that he was destined to die, but he knew, also knew that his disciples were lacking that faith or were just rejecting the thought of him dying. Either they chose to not have faith or they just reject the idea of their savior going to die. And Peter actually said it. He said, not going to happen. Jesus is not going to die. Jesus must sp stop speaking like that. But, and when we go back now to, the, let me just add something to the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember, remember Jesus said, predicted that he said to them that some would be standing and would not taste death. Jesus wanted them to understand, yes, I am going to die. But on the third day, on the third day, have this hope and remember the Transfiguration experience also is a glimpse of what the second coming of Jesus would be like. We see the glitter, we see the triumphant, we see those who are dead and those who are alive and everybody dead together. So he was giving them that life lesson. Don't be hopeless. You're, I'm going to die. I am going to be on the cross. I am going to be exposed. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be rejected by the scribes and the Pharisees. But have this faith. Be hopeful. And remember, what I like to is that while they were on the Mount of Transfiguration, remember God himself spoke and said, this is my beloved son, beloved. Leave, listen to what he's saying. And maybe that lesson is being given to us as a church today. Let us listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. And so that we can follow God. So yes, right there on the mount, we also have the lesson of during the resurrection. We're going to have some who will not taste death. They will witness Jesus' second coming. And the Bible says we'll be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And there will be those who will be resurrected. We know what Thessalonians says that the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we that are alive and remain shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. So I think Jesus is giving that whole exercise right there to just encourage them to accept the fact he must die in order to save us from sin. But after that, there's going to be the resurrection morning. 
Absolutely. So after that, there'll be resurrection. And the disciples needed to understand what was taking place. But as you quite rightly said, Elder Gordon, that that took some time to, for them to sink in the real purpose of Christ's coming. Because we see it in other parts of Scripture where they're arguing amongst themselves and having all kind of scribbling and who's going to be the greatest and so on. And so we must take note of that even in this current postmodern world in which we live in. We must understand the times that in which we're living and the purpose and not to be fooled by, you know, any, any, every wind of doctrine that is throwing us about speaking spurious doctrines. So we come to the second part of the study for this morning, and that's the, the multitude. We looked at the mountain, the mountain of transfiguration. We looked at Christ being there, transfigured, and Elijah and Moses and the significance of that and so on. But now at the, the bottom of the mountain, coming down from the mountain, we see in further in Mark chapter 9 and verses 14 to 29 onwards, that there was something taking place at the bottom of the mountain where the other nine disciples were. And help us to understand, Elder Kyle, what actually took place. Let's summarize it for, for us. What took place and how did Jesus deal with that situation, in particular, one particular father of a son? I find it interesting that on the heel of, of Christ's glorious demonstration to his disciples, one of the ways that he sought to strengthen their, their faith the most that Satan was at work at the bottom of the mountain. And what was going on here now is that, you know, Jesus went up with three disciples. He had the other nine at the bottom and a man came and he sought to have, you know, his son relieved of a demon as a demon was tormenting his son, but they, they couldn't heal him. Now, Jesus had given the disciples authority over all of these things. And we know that the, the, as the scripture says that the Lord's hand is, is not short, you know, that he cannot save. But the issue is, is that sin came into amongst the nine. And as you rightly said, is that, you know, for example, the, those three, they were, you know, they were seen or perceived as Christ's favorite. And, and you know, I guess a little dissension, a little gossip and backbiting and different things started to happen. And when you use a sanctified imagination, you could think about that because that was something that was rife throughout the, the life of disciples. But because of that and due to that, now they lacked the power to cast out the demon. And the villagers, you know, those who were there now, they were looking at disciples and saying, wait. Why Why ha do you not have the power to do this? This is something that he did all the time. And it became a scene of mocking or derision that you would see. But during that same moment that Jesus, as a man who's always on time, he came down with heavenly dignity, came into the midst and he started to assess the situation. So he looked at the disciples, he looked at the people and, you know, the father so happy that he sees Jesus that his eyes, he locks eyes with Jesus and he says, look, Jesus, if you can do anything, have compassion upon us. And you know that word, if is a big word, because when Satan came to Christ, that is the exact same thing that he said. And sometimes people may think that because you're not demon possessed, that it doesn't mean that you can't be influenced by, by um, Satan. And Satan can influence us by placing unbelief in our hearts and minds. Even he knows that Jesus could do something, there's still some semblance of doubt. There's still some semblance of unbelief. And what Christ seeks to do as I bring all of this together is that Christ looks at him and he says, look, if you, if you can believe, so he uses back the same word that he chose it back to him. He says, if thou canst believe that all things are possible to him that believe it now. So Jesus challenges that man on that same point of unbelief. And the father recognizes, look, I need to have my faith in order so that my son's life can be healed and that he can be spared from the possession. And he cried out, he confesses unbelief, and Christ delivered that boy. And I believe that, that this small passage has numerous amounts of lessons for us living in these times. Too much to, to get into, but you know, that's my little um, sound bite of what happened there at the bottom of the mountain. Excellent. That's an excellent sound bite, Elder Kyle. You know, we need to have faith. We need to believe. The Bible speaks about, in remember which gospel it was, but it speaks about Christ could not do many miracles there, the word of God says, because the people did not believe. We've got to believe, and we can also influence the work of the Lord by our unbelief. And so in this case, the Father had to cry out to Christ. And you know, that, that passage of scripture uh, for me, and um, I believe for others as well, it's a, a telling passage of scripture where he says, I believe, help my unbelief. In the final of fact, pass me now to a gentle savior. That song that is in the hymnal, well-known song. There's a line in it that says, help my unbelief. And so if perchance we have unbelief, let us do like this man. Let us learn from him and say, look, Lord, I recognize because you, God already knows, you know, whether we have to believe or not. Just be honest and tell him, Lord, help my unbelief so we can move forward with that. All right. So we're at the, almost the end of our study for today. 
And Elder Gordon, I'm coming back to you now. In what situations, if any, I don't know if you have any sister, Elder Gordon, have you had to cry out, I believe, help my unbelief? Any such situation or maybe a situation of a close relative or friend or church member where the person that they cry out, help my unbelief? Many times I have to do that on a personal level. You know, sometimes you pray and you ask God, I will ask God for certain things. And certain things I'm telling in my subconscious, I say, okay, this one might be a little tough. And then when you see certain things happening and the Lord comes through, I am telling you, I do that many times. I ask the Lord to help me, help my unbelief, strengthen my faith, Lord. So on a personal, le personal level, I can answer that, not looking at anyone else. Yes, I have done it, and I have constantly asked the Lord, help me and strengthen my faith until you come or call me. And just to follow up, Elder God, how how is those instances or times, how, how have they helped you in your Christian work? How have those experiences either strengthen or I don't know. I don't want to put words into your mouth, but how, is, how have those experiences helped you? Yes, they have. They have. And when I go with the scenario, I talk to someone one-on-one -on -one, and their situation, even if it's not similar, we're talking to the same God who never changes. And there are times when I use my personal situation to help that person to understand, listen, God will come through for you. And also, even if he doesn't answer the way, because I think that is so critical. Oftentimes, we have a tunnel vision. And so we are thinking on only what we can see. But God knows the future. He knows what's happening tomorrow. And so we always have to be mindful. God knows what's best. And I've proven that in my personal life many times. Asking for one thing, something else comes around. And I smile at God and I say, God, thank you. You know what is best. So I use it in my personal life, personal witnessing, one-on-one, -on -one, in a group setting, whatever it is. I use all my situations to strengthen someone else's faith so they can understand God is real and he loves all of us with an everlasting love. Amen, amen. Elder well, Kyle, today we looked at the multitude and the mountain, or the mountain and the multitude. And we look at basically the, the dichotomy or the split between the two facets of the title. What would be, Elder Kyle, for those who are viewing, for all of us here, what would be your takeaway from today's study of this particular lesson? For me, I think I would let my takeaway be in three points. And what my three points would be is that... First and foremost, that there is nothing that happens in our life by chance. You know, if you recognize Jesus took the disciples up there to strengthen their faith, they didn't just see Moses and Elijah just because Jesus was one to show off Moses and Elijah or the Father in heaven wanted to, or they saw Jesus being transfigured. But what's happening there is that it was a something to strengthen our faith. And sometimes even things, even being left at the bottom of the mountain is to strengthen your faith too. Because you must believe that the same Jesus that went up is the same Jesus that will come back down and deliver you out of that situation. The next thing is that, you know, that we are, uh, we have to have unity amongst ourselves. You know, the Bible speaks a lot about being peace at peace with one another. You know, that is one of our biggest, that's the easiest, the, the easiest commandment in the Bible and the hardest one is love one another. <laughs> You know, it's love one another. That's the easiest and the hardest one. It's easy to do, but sometimes it's extremely difficult. But, you know, we must always behold the face of Jesus to be able to do it. Because if you look on each other, it's a virtual impossibility. But if you look to Christ, you know, all things are possible. And I say that the last um, thing that I would say is that all battle is, you know, the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. And oftentimes we, we deal with these things carnally. You know, we deal with things, you know, if you're like me in school, you're looking at tuition, rent, food, this, that, and say, Lord, how, how are you going to get through these things? But the funny thing is you forget that for two years, God has kept you perfectly fine and you have not lacked anything. And due to these things, you know, oftentimes what we have to do is keep the memory of God's mercies and how he has led us thus far fresh in our minds and look at the experience and the lives of others and know that God will always provide. And if he doesn't, that you can select it like Daniel and the three Hebrews, that you will still trust him. And that, you know, even if God doesn't deliver, that he's still our God, because our allegiance to God is not based on whether or not he delivers us from a situation or circumstance, but it's based on who he is, his character, his love, and the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ on the cross, that will redeem us. And that one day, that even though we may not be delivered from an immediate circumstance, that he has promised to wipe away all tears from our eyes and that he will make all things well and right everyone. So I think those are the three simple takeaways and points that I'd like to throw out to our listening audience this morning. Thank you so much, Elder Kyle, for that takeaway three-pointer. 
Elder Gordon, your final words for today, your takeaway. Yeah, my takeaway, I go right back to the memory text for this week. And I zero in on whosoever desires, whoever desires to come after me. Let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. I want to personalize this. Recognizing that Jesus' desire is to follow him, to deny myself or whatever my cross situation is, is to just follow. And I wish that all Whispering Hope families, that you too, you will just personalize and recognize that since your desire is to follow Jesus, let us do as he bid us to do. And that is deny ourselves. Take up our cross daily and follow him. Thank you so much, elders Gordon and Philip. We pray that today's study was indeed a blessing to those who have viewed the mountain and the multitude. On the mountaintop, beautiful transfiguration, spiritual movement, touching the three disciples. Down at the multitude, at the bottom of the hill, we see unbelief. But thank God that even in times of unbelief, times of doubt, even when Peter opened his mouth upon the mouth of transfiguration, he was saying, let's build a tabernacle, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Uh, Peter didn't really know what he was saying. But you know, sometimes it's not always the understanding, but it's the trust in God. While God calls us to get wisdom and to gain understanding, yes, he also asks us to have faith and to trust in him. And so where we find there is unbelief, let us do like this man and says, Lord, help my unbelief and move forward with that. We pray that today's study was a blessing to you. May God continue to bless you. Don't forget we come back tomorrow with another lesson on Wednesday's lesson and indeed another host, another panel. May God bless all of those who continue to spread the gospel through Whispering Hope and that you will continue to be ardent viewers and promoters of the word of God. Until next time, God bless you. Have a wonderful day.